Hello and welcome to Starting Conversations. I'm Bethany Tabor and this program is brought to you by the New Mexico Humanities Council. This session is part of our newest Starting Conversations series on community archiving. And during this series, we'll be exploring the practice of archiving and expanding our understanding of what it is and what it means. Many of us are familiar with the academic approach to archiving, which is cataloging and organizing information housed in one place, typically like a library. But community archiving is an approach that sounds sort of new, but actually goes farther and farther back into human history. In fact, if it weren't for community archiving, traditions and culture ways would not be preserved in the way that we know them today. And we will dig into that later. Um, this, this series is highlighting the Manita Community Memory Project, which is a digital community-based archive that is facilitated and organized by the New Mexico Highlands University Department of Media Arts and Technology. This session is facilitated by Shane Flores with guests Lily Padilla and Natasha Vasquez. Conceptual artist and interdisciplinary culture worker, Mr. Flores is community facilitator for the Manitas Community Memory Project and is the principal at Studio Wet Future, developing history and culture-based content for cultural institutions, including the Bradbury Science Museum, the City of Las Vegas Museum, New Mexico Department of Cultural Affairs and UNM Maxwell Museum of Anthropology. He holds a BFA in Media Arts from New Mexico Highlands University in Las Vegas, New Mexico. Lily Padilla is a New Mexico Highlands University graduate with a BFA in Media Arts with an emphasis in visual communications. She is currently working with an internship through the Media Arts and Technology Department for the Manitas Community Memory Project. She works with graphic design, illustration, and project management for Manitas. Lily is excited to contribute to the archive as part of connecting to her community. Natasha Vasquez graduated from New Mexico Highlands University with a degree in media arts with an emphasis in multimedia and interactivity. She is currently doing an internship through Highlands working with the Manitas Community Memory Project. She feels incredibly grateful to be working on projects that are committed to archiving her community and culture. She mostly works on illustrations, animations, and some design. Shane, I will let you take it from here. Alrighty, cool, thank you. Thank you, Bethany. Um, so, uh, and because they are working so closely with us uh, and what Lily and Natasha will be referencing later, I do want to contextualize a little bit the Manitos Commemory Project and give some background so that people know what we're talking about. Uh, so um, the focus of the Manitos Community Memory Project is the creation of a digital community archive for Manitos culture and history. Uh, the archive is intended to serve the dual purpose of preserving a digital record of cultural continuity, meaning of course, photos, documents, audiovisual recordings, and digital records of objects, but also providing access to this cultural rec record. Uh, as our project director, Esteban Real Galvez puts it, a place for Manitos people to see themselves. Uh, um, I wanna take a moment to address some common questions that people have. Um, when they encounter this project at first. The first is the term Manito itself. This is probably, uh, um, well, what, what this ends up being is the simple answer is that it's a self-applied identity within the land-based culture that emerged in the mountains of Northern New Mexico and Southern Colorado during the Spanish colonial land grant period. And it's kind of shaped by the dynamics of those land grants, both the private ones, the community ones, which are, really the, the, the larger loom large in, in the identity formation and also the Pueblo land grants. Uh, the second is what is a community archive? And um, that is a rather big subject and we're gonna talk about it, but kind of what is I think important in that sort of uh, aspect of, of, of interpretation is that um, the Minus archive is, an archive, and so there's an understandable focus on preservation. But being a community archive kind of means that there's a, a pro pronounced emphasis on access as well. Uh, in the case of the Manitos project, that concept of uh, Manitos seeing themselves in the archive is a foundational tenet. Uh, in fact, there's uh, that's perhaps one of the great strengths of a community archive is that it can build in accessibility in a way that traditional archives are not particularly suited for. Uh, Legion are the archivists at institutional archives that lament how the structure of their archives do not allow for easy access and sometimes even discourage it. Uh, many an archivist that I talk to 
uh, spends a great deal of time strategizing and conspiring to make the materials in their collections known to the world. So to that end, the Manitos Archive has always been mindful of the balance between preservation and access, and working with artists and designers has been an integral part of that. Uh, it's artists, designers, and people who aspire to be artists and designers that will discover materials in the Minios archive and put them back into play in the culture. And uh, to that end, Minios Project is fortunate to have Lily and Natasha, who are two Manita creatives who work closely with this project through our partnership with NMHU Media Arts Department to kind of explore accessibility and activation. And in many ways, they're modeling uh, how access and activation will feature and how the archive is used and energized in the community as a community archive. So to kind of get the ball rolling um, and kind of want to ask each of you what's kind of a similar question, slightly different. And I think I'm going to start with you, Natasha. Uh, what has been your favorite project to work on so far in regards to the Minutos archive? Yeah, my favorite project to work on so far, I think, has been the short story, Atole y Café. It was done in a comic style format with a few animations. I just had a lot of fun personifying the inanimate objects of coffee. Anatole illustrating them having this verbal battle where Atole ends up winning, which for me represented Manito culture winning. Oh, um, can you tell us why you selected uh, the, the, the comic format, that, that sort of active comic format? I've always been interested in that kind of style and I think it helped be able to go back and forth between the two characters very easily. Okay, cool. And, and Lily, what have you found most interesting uh, through the projects that you've worked on with Manita Project so far? I think from the projects I've worked on so far has been the storytelling. Um, it's, you know, interesting to hear about these shared stories and, you know, from different time periods and, you know, uh, such things as that, um, especially with the first project I had started with Monitos. Um, that's where I had essentially read these um, stories that were from, came from interviews and, you know, passed on from fellow Monitos. Okay, um, great. And so kind of shifting over to, you know, speaking more generally about the archive and, you know, the archive through the lens of Manitos Project. Um, well, I, I've talked with both of you, so we'll, we'll go uh, one after the other in this. And let's let's stick with you, Lily, since you're you're here on the screen. Is um, you, you know, we talked about how both of you have grown up Man Manita in a tourist-heavy environment, and how that affected how you viewed your heritage growing up. And so I know this has informed a lot of how you work. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? that uh, relationship in that environment? Yeah, um, I think, you know, definitely come from a heavy tourist town being Taos, New Mexico. Um, you see a lot of people coming to explore the arts and the history of the people of, you know, Northern New Mexico or any parts of New Mexico. And just, you know, sharing that amongst others. Um, I definitely think it's given me definitely the creative out, outlet that I do have and I work with every day and I'm very fortunate of that. Um, but I also, the, the way I grew up as well, mannerisms and experiences of living up North <clears throat> from Taos as well. And, and sort of like, you know, as the view of your heritage, right? Like, how do you think that being amidst the tourists, as one might say, affected how you saw your heritage and things like that when you were younger? Um, you know, when I was younger, I don't think you think about those things as much, like until you realize when you're older, like, you know, that there's this charm that, you know, my hair, that this heritage has, or, uh, you know, this money, the heritage, um, I think it's just being able to share and express that with others that are coming from all around the world. It's just, you know, it's great to see that. Okay, cool. And and how about yourself, Natasha? What do you think is was growing up in that sort of, you know, where tourists sort of had this sway over the public spaces and stuff like that? How did how do you think that affected yourself and and how you viewed being a Manita in, you know? 
It was definitely very interesting because I remember as a kid, we'd once in a while, I guess, play tourist and we'd walk around the plaza and go to like the very many, many galleries <laughs> and seeing all the different art definitely affected me. Yeah. Playing tourist, that's an interesting game. <laughs> it's very true. It's very true. I still do that even now. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So can you tell us a little bit of how you move around in the world as a tourist different than as sort of yourself? <laughs> Um, well, I guess like in house, like, you know, you, you know, instead of just like, I, I guess like going, like, I think it's like when you want to spend the day doing something different besides like what you, like, you know, you would normally do like spending, just going to a friend's house or family's house. It's like, you know what? I kind of want to do something different. Just like walk around and see things like just go in the plaza. I feel like the plaza is the main spot of playing tourists is just going into the little shops and galleries there just kind of admiring the stuff that's around and just being like oh hey like kind of fitting with the tourists but you know you're local <laughs> I don't know something like that and, and so Natasha how did it affect how you viewed your heritage growing up especially when you would do something like that which I think is kind of fun is uh like you know what was your view of your heritage when you were younger yeah I would say the paintings that were in all the galleries were somewhat very similar so it had like the same kind of color palette and like the earthy tones and everything yeah did those colors and tones look for you for you did they look like things that you felt were part of your world or was it kind of like this is a color palette for the tourists and doesn't really apply to my what my world i actually think they did apply to my world although i think sometimes they were a bit muted so i think somewhat we are a bit more colorful <laughs> Okay, so there was a difference there. So, so um, kind of segueing into, um, uh, you know, as, as artists and designers, when you did, you know, arrive at the Highlands Media Arts Program and then being brought on for the Manitos Project, um, uh, how do you think your, your perspective changed, especially in relationship to like your views of how you were experiencing your heritage and stuff? And since, well, at least you're on my screen right now, Natasha, why don't you go ahead and tell me what your thoughts were on that? Yeah. We, I think my approach to my projects are still the same. And so I'm still doing a bunch of research when I start a project. But I have to say the main difference is that instead of looking for secondhand information, I'm trying to gather information from my own family and trying to look through there. Okay, so it's it's much more direct now. Your energy, yeah. your, your your research is 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 direct and firsthand. Okay, cool. And Lily, you and I at, at one some other point had actually talked a little bit on this subject. How about yourself? How how do you see that as being what you know? What's changed there? I think like you know, same as Natasha, like um, you know, a different source of research, definitely more direct, or you know, coming from people close knit and very local to the community. Um, yeah, I think that's definitely been one of the big ones. Um, I think also being able to um, reach out to people um, immediately, like, you know, like family and stuff, or even um, just having that uh, connection, just even from being in a small, from a small town as small as mine is. Uh, just having that connection to talk to people that I know. <laughs> yeah. Pri prior to the Minitos project, um, the projects that you did or even prior, well, I don't know when that was in relation to when you started at Highlands, but was there any aspects of kind of heritage culture to the projects that you did? Um, I guess you first, Lily, like as a designer, was it like I'm doing things that reflect the Manitos culture or were they like could have been from anywhere kind of projects but prior to the Manitos project? I think they definitely felt closer to home because you know it is telling of stories of where um, you know of northern New Mexico and parts of southern Colorado. I think you know that's always been really a great experience as part of work with Manitos and also like I have had um, uh, worked with them um, uh, 
doing stuff for the New Mexico Hemis Historic Site. Um, so that was actually another project that was had a great opportunity of working with was, um, you know, gathering like, you know, working on the content based off those types of stories and, you know, seeing the land and different parts of these New Mexico and understanding the histories. So I think that's always been really cool. Oh, and, and Natasha, I'm going to ask you from this perspective, because I mean, so, you know, you and I have always talked from the beginning of your work on this project, especially of illustration, or at least I used to talk about how how you were able to synthesize some of your influences, particularly from art from elsewhere, like, you know, modern uh, anime or manga type styles and things like that. But now that I think about it, I don't think I saw a lot of your work prior to the stuff that you were doing for the project. Do you think before you worked on those illustrations for the Manitos project, like, what do you think that relationship was between your influences from elsewhere and how you integrated it? Were you doing like art that could have been from anywhere before the Manitos project and now focused on there? Or had you always had sort of a heritage aspect to what you were doing? Um, I think for the most part, it could have been, my art could have been like from anywhere. Yeah. But I was very grateful that I was able to like combine my connection to other things with my own culture. It made me think a lot more deeply about my art. Yeah. I have to say, I'm happy to, that how well the synthesis has gone. Like clearly, actually in my mind, it's one of the success stories we've had is uh, how, how the the very modern and traditional synthesize in your illustration um so um kind of talking a little bit now like moving more into the archival realm um is i, I want to talk a little bit or have you have you guys talked a little bit about um archival materials as as resources for artists and designers um like what does an archive need to do or be to be useful to creatives like so you know in some ways this is what do you what what do you think needs to be an integral element that you like about traditional archives and and what might be different that would be really helpful to creatives when when working with archival materials um go ahead and you go uh lily yes i think you know traditionally and you know like with archival stuff it's always been a lot of physical type of documentation and that could be you know such things like papers photos you know, objects. And I think what's been cool about this archival type of work is that we've been kind of making this digital element of it. And, but, you know, still trying to hold like that traditional values that they have in these uh, materials. Cause you know, um, don't wanna, you know, you don't wanna lose that. I mean, a part of that, you know, archive and just, you know, the history that you, you can feel close to that. Um, so I think, you know, trying to uh, best um, preserve this like type of archive and the best way to digitize it without losing that essence. Okay. And, and so like kind of in that, right? Like, mm -hmm. like you, as you pointed out, this is a digital archive and it's digital and that is what's different about it. So when you go in there, like what 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 as a creative and and particularly one working in sort of a digital medium like what do you need from there like what is it that you are looking for that a digital archive needs to do to to give you what you need i think it just depends on the mediums itself i think with the photos like um make you know preserving that like by scanning them maybe and then like you know and then sometimes like you know some people enhance the photos and just to for a better quality, but I think sometimes leaving the photo qualities the way they are, they like are, it just you know demonstrates like the like that um, history to it. But um, for that, it, as an example, or when it comes to like literacy, like um, documentation, um, you know, I think just a matter of how you can best preserve and work with them. But um, um, yeah. Uh, kind of lost okay. my thought. Okay, cool. No, that, that that was great. Thank you. And what about yourself, Natasha? What 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 can the what can the archive provide to you as a creative that that helps you with your creativity? 
I think when looking at the archive, I'd be looking for a story, something that I could tell and show that I can share with people and the community. Okay. So, so really the context of a material, like you don't want to just see the photo, you want to see the story that goes with it. And so that's an important thing that comes out of the archive. Yeah, information. Okay, no, that's very, that's a very interesting point, actually. Um, yeah, because maybe sometimes often the archive just wants to save the thing and they don't want the story. So that seems to be one of the things that I think that the Manitos project is trying to do is make sure that the story is included. So I'm going to take note of that answer and we'll take it back and make sure it's in the drawing board for that. Um, is there is there anything so regards to the story like I mean is that just a different thing? Is there a particular type of story or or hook that you're looking for? What what are you hoping to tease out of the archive there? I'm not well I'm just kind of looking for any story something that I guess catches my eye. Got it. So, okay. So open and free form. Um, I actually do want um, you guys uh, to talk about uh, the Quadernos that you're working on, um, because it is something that it seems to have come out of the archival material. Um, and, uh, you know, it kind of, when I know when it started, it was also fusing the far past with the immediate present together. So maybe we'll take this in pieces. So maybe let's start, um, and we'll start with you, Natasha, uh, tell me, let's drill down a little bit into Quadernos. Tell me what your thoughts and experience have been as working on or this Quaderno project and tell us a little about it. It was super interesting because we were able to get stories from you where it connected what was happening now with COVID and people's experiences and then the Spanish flu, which were very similar to each other. And so that was very interesting. Those stories were definitely there for that, wasn't was yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. And and in your creative process, like what tell us a little about how the archives and the like what was your process for the with the archives for for the work that you did? Because you did a lot of illustrations for those quaderns. Yeah, my main job for that was creating like illustrations for inside the book and for the cover. And so for me, the archive helped in like I had to draw a printing press. So I had to find an image of something that was here during that time. Cool. I should probably, well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do this after. Lily, you go ahead and tell me what your general experience was regarding the Quadernos. And yeah, the it was, oh no, <laughs> you're, you're good. Um, it was interesting. Like, again, the stories were obviously like, you know, the most interesting part of it. And then kind of the shared and similar experiences that they both had those both those pandemics or you know of those time periods like they were very similar but um it was you know it was interesting to hear like how they like those were handled through each of those time periods and then um I think when it came to designing this um the cuadernos themselves we had wanted to kind of keep like we had wanted to like kind of mix contemporary and like the modern parts of like artwork in some ways. So I think that was like, you know, the inspiration was like, you know, mixing time periods, but at the same time, like, you know, keep it to where it's somewhat contemporary. I don't know. It was kind of, it was interesting in that. And then the art mediums that Natasha definitely used um, with the illustrations being that she did illustrate some of these things on like by drawing them on paper herself and then uh, being able to digitize them and make them into digital um, artwork, but also, you know, still using digital artwork by digital painting some things as well. So I think that was really cool. It was like being able to use different mediums for that and then incorporating that into the design frame of like the publication too. Because um, even through some of the pages, there's some of like those um, essence in there. So it was really, it was really cool to try to work and design around those. Okay, that, that's to me a very interesting point you break up. So if you ask you to elaborate a little on that, which is the sort of tension between um, uh, 
Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Real quick. That's okay. No, uh, everybody, we had a power outage earlier and it, it was bad, but it didn't happen this time. So I was okay. for a second, but you did freeze. Uh, so I'll, I'll restart the question is, um, uh, so the, the, um, you bring up an interesting point to my mind, which is a tension between kind of a, a knowledge of the past and the technology of that, particularly like the media technology, like Natasha mentioned, the printing press, and what you guys are doing now as digital artists contemporary. So I guess I'd ask you to elaborate a little bit on how you view that tension between, between uh, time, I guess, media, media and time, yeah. Yeah, I think what's interesting, like, you know, with, like, you know, with, like, physical art form, you know, it's like you, you have to, it takes time to, like, collect that sort of material and kind of figure out, like, how you want to make, you know, create the type of artwork and form where digital, like, you know, it's the same, but it's obviously, like, you know, you can kind of manipulate and copy paste some types of digital format <laughs> it doesn't you can kind of have shortcuts in some ways of creating the art as where you know physically like drawing and painting it takes a lot more time and key to detail not that digital painting or things like that or don't take time they sure and <laughs> absolutely do but there's definitely a difference in uh the usage and, and Natasha, um, in regards to like, say that the illustrations that you did do, I mean, that the difference is, is that, and, and Lily alluded to it, right? Like you're drawing and then you're having to digitize the things that you drew to so be able to work with them in the digital environment. Is that for you, uh, like what's the challenge there for you and that is, does it change how you do your art? I think it does change it a bit because I think it takes me a bit longer if I'm taking something that is supposed to be a real object yeah. and then I'm trying to be as accurate as I can so that mm -hmm. it's represented correctly. Okay. Um, I'm going to take a second because I realized we didn't really explain what the quadernos are. I, actually, oh. <laughs> I think maybe uh, it's better if you guys explain what the quadernos are. And so uh, we'll go one at a time. I'd like you to tell me about the quadernos, like what they are. Uh, so that uh, people understand what we're talking about. But also, um, I mean, as a kind of a follow-up, you can put these things together if you'd like, because I, this, is, this is something that's related is, you know, you did this project in the, well, you know what? I'm sorry, and I, I'm sorry to be all over the place. We'll do this separate. Go ahead and let's do that part. Tell, tell us what the quadernos are and, and how you see them. Uh, Lily, you go ahead and go. Okay, so the Cuadernos were um, had started out as original, uh, originally a digital publication that um, our stories collected by locals um, and interviews uh, done by Shane Flores, <laughs> um, and they um, the stories incorporate both the 1918 Spanish flu and also talking about the COVID nineteen pandemic um, stories and like you know talking about the differences and similarities between them and what impacts that occurred with that and also including uh, stories such as like the remedies that were used in the time period and uh, things such as that. Okay, Natasha, anything to add to that description? Um, I'd say it's like a series of booklets that connect both the Spanish flu and COVID-19. Yeah. So, so yeah, so, and, and so each of the quadernos does have kind of a, they each have their own format related to what they are talking about. Like there's the one that has the healing and healing stories and then the interviews have their own. So, so mm -hmm. um, uh, and you know what? I'm so invested at this point in your guys' work. I actually forgot I had done some of the original interviews. So yeah, it reminded me I'd forgotten. So um, the follow-up question kind of really was, um, and this will be, something I don't know. So we, you know, we did this project or you guys did this project in the middle of COVID, right? Or right at the beginning and through the middle. And it was very much a COVID project, at least in its sort of mood. Now that the project has been re-energized and you're doing it in a new and different way, what has changed between how you feel about it or how you're approaching it then and now? Yeah. 
Oh, I don't know who should go first. <laughs> um, I'd say it's definitely interesting, especially when it was still in the, when COVID was still pretty in the earlier mid phase of that. I think it was definitely interesting having to work on this project at home, first of all. Um, that was a different experience in its own, but I think, um, you know, it's kind of like you, you read these stories and you kind of just kind of like realize like, you know, this is like that reality for them was just as much ours, like, especially reading like about the, how many people were like um, infected and, you know, infected globally. And just, I think it made it more personal, just like seeing the names like of these, you know, these people and then, you know, you know just like, cause it was not just a number, but it, you know, these are people like in seeing their names, it just, it's very sad to like see that. And especially from all age groups, I think that's, I think even as much then as like when I first had that reaction and to now, I think it's still like, I think it's still the same in some ways, but I think differently now it's like people are vac are getting vaccinated and, you know, it's still, even with this vac with vaccines, you know, there's still um, cases and that, you know, the phases of it going down or, uh, you know, peaking, it's just interesting. And, and, you know, what's changed, I think, too, and I, what I think has changed from the project, you can tell me if this isn't true, is because it is a different time now, you know, this was conceived as a digital project in the depth of COVID, and now it's a print project. Like, mm -hmm. how for you, is that a different thing? It's different now because, um, for me, I'm actually able to work in the, you know, the Media Arts and Technology Building as to where I wasn't able to do that last year. And I think, you know, thinking of and being able to see like versions of this like printed, it's interesting, even if they're just sample prints. And uh, I, you know, it's just, it's interesting because I have, um, I think just the print setup, because, you know, with printing design, it's, um, it can get complicated, but it's, you know, it's still something I do love to work with. And I think it's just like, you know, a shift in where I was at last year doing this just for a digital and then here being able to actually make this physical, like a physical copy. It's just like, you know, I didn't expect to see like when to see that or expect to see it as soon as I guess I did maybe. <laughs> Okay, and how about yourself, Natasha? How is this? How is the project different for you now than it was then? Like, yeah. Well, I think times have definitely changed a little bit, but it is exciting to have the books being thought of as printing because then we get to go beyond just sharing them online, but now we get to share them with even probably students and teachers. So it's very exciting to have people read and look at the art. Great. Um, and so kind of uh, the, the last question I have anyway, and then I, I, you know, I want to find out if Bethany has any questions is, and, and this to kind of close it and bring it back to the archive a little bit is, you know, as, as Manitos creatives, or, you know, what kind of projects do you see working on in the future once the Manitos archive is well established? So once there's, you know, tons of things in there, like, what, what is it you'd want to do, like just sort of thinking forward into the future? Like, how do you see using the archive? Go ahead and go, Natasha, you go first. Well, I know I'm just, I'm starting to get into some animations where I get to work with my own family stories. And so I see myself going further into animation because I think that is a very shareable medium that you can put on social media and more to get more people's attention. And so how would you bring archival materials into your animations or how do you see working with them as, as you know, say for example, primarily as inspiration or do you see actually incorporating materials and, and, and you know, uh, working with the materials themselves in your animations? Do you see things like that happening or what do you think? I could see it both ways. Cause like right now I'm working on one animation that is about a marriage proposal and it talks about, uh, a document where you it's like an official document like where you ask someone to marry you well the parents do and so I see bringing in those archive items 
and showing them in the animations. Okay, great. And, and how about you, Lily? How do you see, what kind of projects do you see actually working with out of the Manitos archive once it's, it's a thing? I think I definitely really liked finding like content and material and just being able to digitize those. And then also like, you know, explaining the backgrounds of that type of material, um, especially finding like, you know, personal objects or fa like family objects of my own and keeping mine as well. I'd also want to kind of contribute by putting what I have or what others have into that archive as well and being able to share that story of like how or where they got that or how it came about. I think it's just cool to share that with others. Okay. Do, do you see your guys' future projects going into the archive as well? Do you see that as part of a continuity, like the work that you do, that you would see it being in the archive? Or what do you think? I, I, I like agree. that. Yeah. Sorry. Oh. No, no, thanks, Tasha. You go for it. You go, Lily, and then you tell me, Natasha, what your thoughts were about that. Yeah. I think, I mean, I, I completely think that these are definitely archival material. I mean, it's definitely shared stories that are from time periods, um, you know, and I think that's definitely shareable in archival to especially look back on and be like, wow, what happened at this time? Oh, well, here's some stories about it. Yeah. Okay. And, and so what were you going to say, Natasha? I, I definitely see them being in the archive mainly because like sometimes me and Lily are both using our own family stuff. Like Lily has this box of stuff that I was able to illustrate. And then I'm telling oral stories for my family. So it's, it'd be nice to see those things archived. Okay. So, so actually you guys are, are actually bringing the primary materials out and through your work, you're putting them through your work from the primary materials. Yeah. That is fantastic. That, that makes me very happy. Um, well, uh, Bethany, did you yourself have any questions that you wanted to ask or anything like that? I think um, maybe we're sort of starting to be to, to touch on this, but um, I want to know your thoughts on like advantages, disadvantages between digital digital archiving, digital collections, and like material collections. And I just sort of, or even not even disadvantages and advantages, but even just like sort of the um, the differences that between those two things, something that is very material that you can pick up versus something that is um, digital and living online. Um, what what do you think about that difference and, and as you work on a digital archiving project? I think when it comes to like the, the digital aspect, I mean, it's very visual as to where, you know, you can't physically hold these like, types of materials, I think sometimes like you can see them and you can be like, wow, that's interesting to see. But I think when it comes to like having physical materials, like you actually can feel like the, like the textures in them, I think, especially with like old letters, like how mm -hmm. over time the paper gets like softer <laughs> or even just like, you know, it's like little, little things like that. Um, I think it's like, it becomes more personal holding things. Like, I think it's, definitely a physical like when it comes to those two things it's a physical visual type thing yeah I think for digital it's nice because like I have family that moved across the states who don't get to have that culture with them all the time so they can't hold those objects but for it being digital they can see them and experience them but then they come down they can also experience those physical things yeah the sort of beauty of um of the digital is its wide shareability it's wide access but um but yeah there is some sort of missing a missing part <laughs> when you can't like when you can't hold i mean i think that that is a pretty universal experience by this point in time which is um, yeah August 2021, where we are all severely missing being in each other's presence, but um, that's where the digital steps in. Um, that was my only question to, to sort of wrap things up, but um, I really appreciate your time today and your and your insights, and I love hearing about your experiences um, in just like, you know, like the creative process, finding out what works, what 
what doesn't, what's how you use your own culture and heritage. Um, I think that it's a, it's a great, it's a powerful story. And thank you, Shane, for facilitating this conversation. Um, below in the description of this video, there will be links to um, the Manitos website um, where you can see some of the uh, digital Cuadernos projects and, um, and see pieces of the archive. Uh, and with that, those are my closing thoughts. If anybody else has any closing thoughts. Well, great. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much.